I'm thrilled to be able to introduce and um, converse with Jennifer Brown of Jennifer mm -hmm. Brown Consulting. And she not only is the founder of a well-reputed diversity and inclusion firm, a published author, um, and a just generally fun and exciting person. But she is also a native Californian. Yes. And she hails from behind the orange curtain, which I'll let her explain what that is. <laughs> and she's also a, I'm not sure if it's okay to say recovering <laughs> opera singer. Star. Yeah. A recovering yeah. opera star. Absolutely. Singer. And, um, we're going to have a lot of fun talking today. So the format is that I'm going to just ask her a number of questions, and then we'll, there's a dory associated with the talk. And anyone who is virtual, we invite you to um, post any questions you may have up there as well. And then we'll open up to the floor for questions also. So Jennifer, I'd love to ask you to start off by just sharing a little bit about your story. OK. Uh, so typically where I start about my story is I grew up in a musical family um, in Southern California uh, and I was the oldest of three kids and um, when I was 27 I decided I was going to pursue my love of music full time so I moved to New York City to make it as one does and um, did um, opera conservatory so I got my masters in operatic voice and that was really what I wanted to do. Uh, and one thing led to another in the course of the intense training that one goes through in the opera world. And unfortunately, I injured my voice and I had to get several surgeries. And the recovery from vocal surgery is that uh, you have to be completely silent for several weeks as your mechanism heals. And when you're finally able to make a sound, um, all that comes out is a little squeak. And so I worked with uh, speech therapists and kind of coaxed my voice, voice back, but the writing was on the wall and I knew that um, I would never be able to really uh, use my instrument um, in a full-time role as a performer. Um, so it was really heartbreaking to lose my voice, um, literally, uh, and my creative means of expressing myself and connecting with audiences, which is really what I loved to do. Um, but luckily, friends uh, that had been in the stage and performing world said, why don't you look into the field of corporate training? You know, if you like being in front of people and on the, on the stage, you get to work with people every single day and that's your job. And I thought, wow, that sounds really fun and right up my alley. So I got another master's degree in something called organizational development, organizational change. Some of you may know it as IO psych, IO psychology, which is industrial organizational relations. Anything having to do with um, how organizations function optimally and humans in those organizations. And um, so that kind of saved my, my life and gave me you know, more inspiration to continue and build into the whole field of leadership development. But the, um, so PS, you know, I was meant to use my voice, just not as a singer. And I would come to understand how profound the metaphor of the voice really was for me uh, because I was also in the LGBT community. So I've had a female partner for 20 years. I've been out since I was 22 and I'm now in my 40s. But I absolutely wasn't using my voice in the workplace in a series of corporate roles. Um, even as I started my company 10 years ago, I really worried that I wasn't sure how it would go for me trying to sell contracts to people that were different than me. Would they believe what I say? Would they accept me? Would they um, trust me and my opinion? I mean, I think, um, and you know, still to this day, there are moments when you kind of, you wonder, you know, strategically, you know, how much of my full self can I bring into this situation? Um, does it serve me to share that? You know, is it a learning point? Is it a teaching point? Or is it just going to distract the conversation? Does it really matter? Um, and it, you know, it really does matter. It does matter. And if it doesn't matter to me, it certainly matters to people that are looking for more role models that look like me, you know, and that have my story. And so that's what I kind of always come back to is, is it's important for all of us to stand up and tell our diversity stories. Um, and for me, giving voice to the voiceless in the workplace, and that to me means all diverse talent, i.e. women, people of color, LGBT people, anybody who is not doesn't really conform to what a leader looks like in so many companies that I consult to. Um, I believe in them, and I was one of them, and so it's really us, it's not them. And um, so we dedicate our work at my company to really raising those voices up and also 
teaching the company why diverse talent is so valuable in so many ways and um, bringing, that, bringing that awareness to people. So it's really, it's really a, like it all, isn't it funny, like it makes sense in hindsight when you kind of look at all the pieces of your life and why did things happen the way they did. Um, but I absolutely feel like we're in the sweet spot now and God knows this conversation is hotter than ever, which we'll talk about today. Um, so we're right in the right spot, I think, to be um, carrying this message. Yeah. So we, so I was going to jump in and hit the nail on the head and, and ask you, as you're talking about finding your own voice and um, the struggle, your diversity story, um, you also carry with you the privilege of being able to hide your diversity story. Right. And so I'm curious how you um, build, how you w navigate the space in which there are people who you're trying to work on behalf of people who cannot hide their diversity mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. and how do you build credibility with those people, mm -hmm. and what, how, how, do you, how does that come up in the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It reminds me of when I first got into this work, I, whether people said it to me or not, I think they wondered, what is a woman that looks like that doing in this work? I mean, and I don't know if that was really said to me all that much, but... Um, and it's, it's actually really preposterous that I'm in this work in a crazy way because I, you know, I grew up, I also have a lot of class privilege and I was, went to, a, a, you know, very expensive schools and um, honestly, I, I don't think anyone in my family forecast uh, <laughs> me doing this work. You know, it just wasn't something they even knew about. And that's, mm -hmm. that's true for so many of us, I think, that kind of feel called to do this. And, um, you know, coming out was a really big part of that. I have to say, you know, women's studies in college and, and sort of discovering my feminism was probably even a bigger a bigger aha moment for me growing up in a really traditional family with a really traditional gender roles and expectations of me. Mm -hmm. So the whole process of kind of casting that aside and, um, and kind of striking out on a different path to say, you know, I've got to live true to myself, but I, I felt, always felt compelled to, if I needed to be a role model, I was ready to do that. Mm -hmm. And, if, I w and if, if people needed me to be a champion for them, I was ready to do that. And I think I honestly learned how to do that being in the LGBT community where we needed champions. I mean, we need our straight ally friends so desperately to even just be safe, you know, let alone have conversations that we can't have on our own behalf. So the way I've come to think about it is, um, and I don't know how I, I, I mean, I just, I just show up, you know, and I admit what I don't know. But I also talk a lot about how I have a responsibility to be an ally to others because I have relative privilege because of certain unearned things about me. Um, whether that means I can walk, for example, into an executive room and have people listen to me in a different way because they're making stereotypes about who I am, often incorrect, mm -hmm. right? Um, only for me to then reveal, which I think is a powerful aha moment for many people as well. Um, but I, I see myself as needing allyship, but also um, providing that and, and identifying as an ally. And the LGBT community really gave me that, that language mm -hmm. because I experienced directly what that really meant for a marginalized community. So, you know, I really see it as my job to make sure um, I'm employing my privilege on others' behalf. And I think, you know, I don't know if workplaces are really going to going to figure this diversity and inclusion thing out until we have more people who are thinking about the, their intersectionality more deeply and thinking about what do I have that others need where I can take the hit maybe or I can have the tough conversation or I can be the one that challenges um, where they can't. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think if we had more of that going on, we wouldn't be so penalized, those of us who are always the squeaky wheel, who are always bringing up you know, what's said that wasn't appropriate or challenging somebody's choice about who they pick for a team or who got the job or whatever. It can't always be the woman, you know, the person of color, the gay person, because we, there's lots of studies that show that it's very, um, it puts you in a difficult spot. Um, from a perception standpoint, it can actually hurt you. So we're not alone. You know, we're not alone in fighting these battles, but we've got to figure out how to really utilize people around us. And I'd like them to step up and say, I, you're, I don't need to wait to be asked to do something. I'm going to do something. I'm going to use my privilege, and I'm going to be an ally. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. You mentioned that you come from a background of class privilege. Mm -hmm. How do you think that that, that privilege has, is, facilitates the work that you do? Oh, my gosh. I love that question because it's something I wanted to hide. 
for a really long time. Yeah. We talk about, um, there's a really wonderful research um, on covering out of Deloitte. I recommend you all read it. It's called Uncovering Talent. And it is the, um, the hiding or minimizing, if you can, the minimizing of a stigmatized identity. So some of us can hide it, some of us can't. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my, my class background is something, honestly, that it um, throws people off. And I don't really talk about it that much. Mm -hmm. However, my education forced me to write voluminous amounts um, on all sorts of subjects. It forced me to be on stage in front of hundreds over and over and over again, mm -hmm. which means I'm fearless. I mean, I'm really like, you can't stump me. You can't frighten me. I am so resilient. And you know, part of our output at JBC is like tons of thought leadership. Like we're always writing, we're researching, we're, I'm using a lot of my ability to connect ideas um, in a way, I think speaking the language that my, my readers can absorb and understand. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, honestly, it's that level of polish that you need as a performer is something that I think really helps you deal with the executive level mm -hmm. at companies because you know, the, it's just, a, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough place to be. It's challenging, yeah. um, and you have to really hang in there. And you've got to build, build trust quickly. You've got to influence. You've got to establish credibility. You know, you're already a woman walking into those spaces, which are largely male. So I'm already aware that I've got to sort of overcompensate and be like extra, extra perfect, yeah. <laughs> and um, and extra creative. I think in terms of like, are they listening to me? Are, is that landing? Do I need to take another tack? Like, do I need a personal story here? Do I need some data here? You know, it's, it's I like the challenge of it, um, but I think my background kind of prepared me. And the other thing that prepared me, honestly, is having a really domineering father <laughs> hmm. who's still alive. Um, he's not gonna ever watch this. Um, <laughs> this doesn't leave the four, four walls of Google, but, um, being the oldest daughter of a very, very dominant male figure, uh, just from a survival perspective, I had to really figure out how I was going to endure that, um, but what I was meant to learn from it. And it turns out what I was probably meant to learn from it is how to deal with the people I deal with now, mm -hmm. which are a lot like my dad. Like, that's kind of you know, I have to go into those rooms and do have those conversations and, you know, yelling about it, getting upset about it, it's not going to work. You know, it has to be strategic. It has to be very careful. Um, it has to be thoughtful. It has to be respectful because I think we lose a lot of people if we kind of attack. So, uh, so I think that honestly prepared me. So in the me. middle of all that, um, <laughs> you have to show up as powerful. You are a successful businesswoman. Uh, how do you, do you struggle with imposter syndrome? Yes. Um, I work on it a lot. Does everyone know what imposter syndrome is? Sort of like not really earning the place that you're at and the opportunities that you have. And I think some of us do it to ourselves more than others. Uh, women are notorious for, for playing small, I think. Um, so it's honestly something you have to build the muscle with. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it involves a little bit of believing, drinking the Kool-Aid, it is believing the things that people say to you about how, what a difference you're making every day. Um, it is actually allowing that stuff to land, mm -hmm. you know, instead of pushing it off and saying, oh, they're just saying that, or, you know, that's what we're so good at doing. Oh, it's nothing, brush, you know, minimizing it. You know, I think for us, when you are, you are being successful, you have to let that stuff in. And then you've got to start to believe it mm -hmm. to a degree and um, you know, being obviously practical and realistic about it. But, um, and really, I mean, I, it's just like branding. You know, I think brands are always listening to their audience. I am always listening to mine. You know, what is resonating with people? What do they really appreciate about what we're doing? I'm constantly trying to think, how can I be more valuable? What do they need? And how can we be of service? And so I think if, if you are in service of um, far from being, you know, being called sort of overly confident or self-promoting, um, you're actually adding value all the time. I mean, my MO as a business owner has always been like, what can I write? What can I write about that's not being written about right now? What can I, what can I lend my credibility to and give some weight to so that people start to talk about something I want them to talk about? Mm -hmm. And I love having that. That's power, yeah. but it's power for good. So I think you just have to look at yourself and say, 
you know, I have all these tools at my disposal. It's not, it's only harming me and the world if I don't use them for the purposes um, that I, that I, that I judge are important. Yeah. And after a while in the same field, you, you become an expert. I mean, read Malcolm Gladwell when he talks about the mastery. He says 10,000 hours. You know, how many thousands of hours have I spent? I mean, 300 pages was nothing. I was like, oh, I have to stop. You know, it's just <laughs> like you learn so much. And I think you've got to really just embrace that you are an expert on this stuff, you know, and expertise. I don't even know if 10,000 hours is really needed. Our world is going so fast. We were talking about this last night. To call yourself an expert um, is even changing now to the point where I think the best experts in a way are people who are present, people who are listening, who are agile, who are, who are responsive, who are willing to challenge norms. So I don't know if it means you have like five PhDs. I mean, in what? I think our world is changing so quickly. Mm -hmm. Those of us who, who are at the top level of, of these conversations can synthesize. We can connect the dots. We can make people feel heard and seen. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's the kind of experts we really want, not the ones that you know have been in an ivory tower forever and you know necessarily studying a discipline. Yeah. You know. And what would you say are some of the successes you're most proud of? When you say this, they have to actually land. You have to let them. Land. Oh yeah, I'd say well, giving a TED talk was insane. <laughs> I'd say, you know, speaking of imposter syndrome, I I almost didn't do my TED talk that was that fell into my lap. I, I think I made a lot of excuses about why I wasn't ready or whether I wasn't, um, I don't, I, I knew I needed to come out in the talk, which was important and is important to the organizers actually. And I was like, hmm. So at the time it was 2010 or nine and there weren't a lot of out LGBT TED speakers and there was nobody talking about diversity and inclusion on the TED stage. And it was, you know, it was the wild west of the internet and comment sections and I just didn't know what would happen. Mm. And, um, but even bigger than coming out, I almost didn't do it. Uh, and I look back and I think, this is what happens to women <laughs> in particular. We don't think we're ready. It's, we're scared it's not going to be perfect. Uh, we think we have to do more homework before we're, before we're ready to be that bold. Mm. And honestly, I, I, I delayed in calling the organizers back. I kind of hemmed and hawed. I procrastinated. You know, it yeah. was, and it's really odd behavior for someone like me who so many people want to hear from. And for me to almost say, I'm not, like, I'm not ready for that. Like, what's, that makes no sense. Yeah. That's kind of some wiring thing yeah. that's yeah. going on in a lot of powerful socialization. And you know, when I, when I ended up doing it, I was one of the few women in um, a lineup of lots of men. So there's probably two or three women speakers and maybe 10 men. It was at TEDx Presidio, which is right in San Francisco. So big, like a thousand people. And um, I asked the organizers, are there, why, why are there more, not more women in the agenda? And they literally said, none of the women called us back. <laughs> All the men got back Note to us to immediately. Self. Note to self. They got back immediately to us and they got all of their stuff to us so quickly. And they were so like self-assured about the message that they were going to give. <laughs> wow. I know, right? That is a great anecdote. It's, it's a crazy anecdote. Yeah. And I thought to myself, that was almost me, you know, thinking my story wasn't important enough to share. Hmm. And, you know, the crux of the story I shared was honestly the voice story that I just shared. And, and I thought, I, I thought it would, was like a nothing story. I just was like, eh, who, who's going to care? It's just me, like poor me. You know, how dare I? I'm so privileged. Like, I get to study opera, you know, so why am I up on this stage talking about this? And I guess what I've found subsequently in telling that story so many times is so many people can see themselves in your story in ways that are not literal. You know, it is a metaphor. And the fact that you're being vulnerable on stage, sharing something that you hid, that you were ashamed of, that broke your heart, that you almost didn't recover from is so human and so universal. And it was such an important lesson for me too. And as I teach diversity stories now, especially to people who don't think they know anything about diversity, um, I say, you absolutely do know something about this. We just, have to, we just have to find that for you. And then we need to prepare you to tell it in a way that's authentic and connects audiences to you. And um, my friend says, it's not the pain Olympics. You know, like, let's not stack up all of our grievances right. and say, like, who has suffered? Yes, some of us have suffered more than others. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that you should be silent because actually a lot of eyes are on you. And especially for leaders, we are watching leaders. We need to see who you are, not just, you know, your fancy title or, 
you know, your big name. It's honestly so much about your, your diversity story and when you understood exclusion. Right. And most people know something about that. What's, um, one of the things that's striking me as you're speaking is, is a polarity that I'm seeing between power and vulnerability. Mm. And I imagine that you have to kind of navigate both, flip between them, stretch between them, whatever it is. <laughs> yes. Um, and I'm curious if that's a frame that you've thought about at all or... I like it. I like it. I, I might, I'm envisioning, I'm envisioning a graphic that I could, <laughs> that I could like mock up, but I, it's true. Um, especially for leaders who, for whom um, power meant knowing all the answers, you know, being seen as in charge, um, that the vulnerability was the last thing they wanted to share. And, mm -hmm. you know, and if any of you don't know Brene Brown's work on vulnerability, she gave a very famous TED talk and people nicknamed it the vulnerability TED. And it was all about her research around vulnerability and what a powerful leadership tool it is that is completely underutilized. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's interesting, you know, women being vulnerable is different than men being vulnerable, different than people of color being vulnerable. You know, so it's, it, the message sort of shifts. I mean, there's a degree of risk of, of vulnerability for people who are, who are already have less power. Mm -hmm. Right, so right. We gotta be aware of that. Yep. But people with power, I feel like there's no excuse not to show vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where I get to be kind of an ass kicker in the, in the boardroom. Like, like, you are safe. Like, you have, you are, you're protected. And for you to kind of go out on a limb looks very different than for others to go out on a limb. Yeah. And therefore, you have a responsibility to do that. Yeah. And so that kind of leads me into wanting to talk about um, one of the notions that you cover a lot in your book is the change agent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I'm wondering if you can just share a little bit about, I feel like we've been dancing around that this whole time that we've been talking without naming it. And okay. so I want to name it yes. and invite you to talk about it a little bit. And um, how do you define a change agent and particularly in a corporate space, how, what is the role of a change agent? Yeah, I, I, I love the term because, you know, a lot of us feel called to challenge the system around us. I, and, and wherever you sit in the hierarchy, it doesn't need to be senior. It's a lot of junior people who are creating change from where they are and influencing discussions that are going on and um, being allies to their colleagues, um, you know, volunteering to be part of efforts and initiatives and things like that. So, you know, it's really anyone who takes on the mantle of having courageous conversations, showing up more boldly, speaking on behalf of others when needed, speaking on behalf of themselves, honestly, and showing themselves. So, you know, even if, especially if we have stigmatized parts of who we are, bringing those to the fore, you know, and really leading with them. Um, and for me as a change agent, I think, I think you need to think of wherever you are in the organization, you know, what's your, who are you trying to influence and, and what are they going to listen to? We have to be really good at having like a lot of tools at our disposal. Like I said before, if I'm in an executive room and I want to create change, I've got to know, I like to know where is everyone on this topic? You know, where are they from early adopter, totally get it, super enthusiastic to kind of, you know, apathetic, but listening to active resistor. Um, somebody who doesn't show up, somebody who will show up and be combative or challenging, even of the data. Um, and so when you think about, you know, where, how do I speak to each of these groups differently? A really effective change agent, I think, is somebody who can shift their message and work with the listener. Because if we lose them, we, if we lose them, we lose our mechanism to create change. <laughs> so, but we need to keep them differently. I think they're, um, it, it, it's really interesting work because to me it's audience analysis and I, I enjoy that a lot. I enjoy trying to figure out, you know, where, where are people, what are the questions they have, what are the, um, what are the triggers for change? Mm -hmm. You know, I write a lot about that in the book. When companies call us, there's a, a host of reasons why they call us because they're ready for change. <laughs> like, can be anything from the CEO came from like an Amex and is moving over to say a fast growth tech company. And they'll be like, what is going on right now? Like I came from this company to this company and I went from a totally kind of baked mature strategy that everybody understood to literally nothing. And so that CEO will say, this is not acceptable. We've got to get on the train. And so they may call us and say, you know, 
we got to build what, what I had over there, you got to build over here. Or they may be a very competitive person. They might say, look at their industry ecosystem and say, well, we're behind them, them, and them, and I'm not okay with that. So we got to catch up. Mm -hmm. That's also good. I mean, I don't know if I believe it's like the most altruistic reason in the world, but I'll take it. Um, sometimes it's a personal reason. Sometimes, you know, if it's a male CEO with daughters and, you know, somebody who's been intimately sort of courtside around um, equal, equal opportunity for women and girls and has a personal um, need to leave a legacy that is better than, than um, you know, what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes CEOs get really galvanized around like the pay gap, for example. I mean, many companies don't even know what their pay gap is or they know, but it's like closely guarded in HR and not really shouted from the rooftops. But then you've got like uh, Mark Benioff at Salesforce, who's the CEO there, who's doing some really radical things around pay gap stuff. Like mm -hmm. he's wrote a check for $3 million just to gross up pay for all the people that were underpaid. And that was kind of just his first salvo in the conversation. And then, you know, at the same time, sort of tackling the systemic problems that led to that. So, so there are, everybody's sort of on this big, long continuum. And um, I think you've got to meet your organization where they're at. You've got to meet your manager where they're at. You've got to meet your team where they're at. Um, start local you know, start to suggest that we have open dialogue about this stuff and, you know, build a container for it. Somehow, you know, think about, there's a lot of suggestions in here about what you can do at your level, whatever that is to create change. But know that, um, that the big organizations need sort of pretty sophisticated structures to really shift, shift a culture towards inclusion. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that, um, it's fascinating. How does a, co a huge company that is growing and surviving and dealing with new markets and everything sort of shift towards inclusion? Um, it's way more complex than like hiring and fixing your problem by hiring X number of this, this, and this, right? Who, by the way, won't stay if your culture isn't inclusive. So you've kind of solved one part of the problem, but then you haven't like actually adjusted the culture so that they will stay and grow and thrive. So that's actually a segue into a question that I had for you. And there's a quote in the book where you write, great intentions at the top of the house and even great actions, like we've seen publicly where companies are taking a stand um, politically, whether it's against a Muslim ban or Black Lives Matters or issues that are coming up in the news and companies are taking public stands against those. Um, great actions at the top of the house, great scores on all the indices and lists, and a whole host of awards do not guarantee a healthy culture for all. There's a big difference between talking the talk and walking the walk. Yeah. And so what is your recipe for moving a company f to walking the walk? You love the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> Told you yeah, I wasn't no, going to be I easy. Like it. No, I love it. I love it. Yeah. The, well, so what happens is companies can buy a lot of really fancy marketing. Um, they, and they can even be really well-intentioned and actually really active in social issues. Although I have to say most companies don't say anything about what's going on in the political realm, Black Lives Matter, the Muslim man. I mean, most were silent. And I can tell you that a lot of employees were walking around feeling really jittery and un, you know distressed and that they had to kind of hide all of that as they came into work, you know, in the last six months at various junctures, you know, depending on what has been happening in the last year and a half, actually. So um, I think until leadership especially realizes that um, it's not about, it's not always about the grand public gesture, although they, they actually need to do that more. And that's, that's nowhere near as widespread as I like to see it. Even just the, the email to an all hands, even the inclusion of, a, of an honest discussion about inclusion, even, a, even um, town halls and dialogues and just a space to talk about it is something that I think a lot of legal departments are, are, are jittery about in most of the, now here maybe not, but a lot of the companies I work with are, they want to stay away from it. And, but the silence really speaks volumes and I know that People are looking for leadership in those times to really speak about why am, what I want to hear is why am I important to you working here? Like, it's really human. It's very much, am I seen? Am I heard? Am I understood? Um, even if leadership doesn't look like me, and even if it's not from my community, which typically it's not, um, I still want to hear those messages. And I want them to be heartfelt and authentic and vulnerable. And even if leaders don't have all the answers, they need to say, I don't have all the answers, and yet I'm committed to finding them out together. 
just something like that. It is not about taking political stands. You know, I think a lot of companies stayed quiet because they thought there was just no way to talk about these things without coming out on one side or the other. And it wasn't about that. I think inclusion and inclusiveness is, is, is sort of a universal topic that we can all talk about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so, so I think to walk the talk, it's got to be um, heartfelt. It has to be, um, we've got to the, have the hard conversations inside and not just go for the, the big pop on the external metrics. Mm -hmm. um, although we need to do more of that too, trust me. I yeah. mean, yeah. vast majority of companies aren't doing anything on any of these lists. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, um, so I have a whole set of other questions that I'm dying to ask <laughs> you, but I also want to open up the floor to anyone else that wants to ask questions, um, yes. either on the live stream or yeah, please. in the room. Um, We'd love to hear from you. And I'm happy to keep going if no one's thought of anything yet to ask. But I see a lot of shaking heads out there, though. Does That's anyone have a question <laughs> that they'd like to ask? <laughs> okay, wait, let's get you a yeah, mic here. because we're, we need to have that for the recording. That's right. Hello. Hi, Hello. I'm Kashima. Um, you quoted several books and people that you follow on TED Talks and whatnot, and so I was just wondering, are there certain people that influenced you? I mean, I know your father was a major influencer. Yes. <laughs> Maybe for not the right reasons. And, you know, <laughs> things happening with your voice and whatnot, but were there certain people that you followed and looked up to that helped you to get to where you are now? Boy, that's a great question. Oh. Uh, well, I, I'd probably say there are some leading chief diversity officers that I've had the privilege to work with in so many different companies um, that I've worked in um, that are fearlessly leading their company with not a lot of resources. Um, they are, it's a really, really hard job to do these jobs. Um, you are, you constantly are sort of in doubt in terms of the legitimacy of what you're actually doing and there's so much pushback so you spend like so much of your time trying to figure out like how do I again shift the steer the ship and um, you know get it to move so you know I was always following this diversity leaders at companies like IBM and Wells Fargo and um, a lot of financial services companies honestly um, who've been doing this for a really long time uh, longer than the tech space. And I think more, more deeply and more widely, it's, they've sort of baked it into their structure. Um, and so I've learned a lot from those really advanced um, cult cultures that have been going after this for a long time. And you know, listening to CEOs who talk about diversity and inclusion and sort of carefully monitoring how do they talk about it so that I can then take that and teach other CEOs and executives how to talk about it. Um, Jim Turley, who was the CEO of Ernst & Young, was a really amazing guy, especially on LGBT rights. And he was a straight, white, cisgender man um, leading this massive global company that was very, very adamant about LGBT equality and, and gender equality in his workforce. And so just getting to interview him on the stage was really cool. And honestly, it's kept me going because those people like him give me hope that there are there are more of them out there that are they're on the learning curve, they're on the journey. They need to be either awakened or equipped, um, or maybe made comfortable with being, you know, a spokesperson for these things. So I think like they were really meeting people like that has been really transformative for me because I know that it can happen. We just need to. We need to create more of them. And that's the big thing that keeps me up at night is how do I how do I ignite leaders that look like him to speak about these things so that it makes it safe for the rest of us to really show up and bring our full selves to work. Because that's gonna really shift it. It's yeah. It's I'm gonna ask a follow-up question if anyone has a question, raise your hand and we'll get you the mic. But I'm, it's interesting to hear you say that the financial services industry has been doing this work for a long time and deeply, because that's not necessarily what an industry think. that I would think of <laughs> as like a particularly inclusive industry. Yeah. So I'm curious what, it's like interesting to hear you say that, and I'm curious what the impact of that investment has been. Yeah. Um, in, in those companies, have you, what do you see when you're in there? Right, that work? right, well, I mean, you see, you see a lot of, a lot of employee resource groups that are really huge, like they're just, they're just massive. Like they have tens of thousands of people in them, kind of big, with their own, they're sort of a city unto themselves with their own org charts. They have lots of executive buy-in. They're sort of multiple levels of 
steering committees and um, like executive councils and in different parts of the business. So it's really baked out. If you were envisioning it, it's got arms and legs um, at different levels and especially the penetration, I think, to the senior levels. Um, and they, um, you know, Wells Fargo, for example, is investing in diverse talent by uh, graduating thousands of diverse leaders through a, a particular leadership development program that is just for each segment. And I'm involved in their LGBT program where we've graduated 500 high potential leaders. I'm not seeing that in tech. You know, um, we need it desperately. We need it in every single industry. It doesn't matter which one. But, but, and the fact they've graduated thousands of black leaders through their high potential program. And these are people that are mid-career. They're in that really critical time where they need to kind of sit back in a homogeneous group and say, here's what's getting in the way for me, for my career. And, and, and I'm going to, here's my peers. And we share these experiences. How can we kind of think about shortcutting this where, where their bias is showing up or, you know, who can we leverage on the plus side that is supportive of like, who's your mentor? Who's your sponsor? You know, could I have lunch with that person? You know, so the whole networking thing that happens amongst these communities um, behind closed doors shores up that community. It gives that community a voice and gives them confidence and it makes them feel important to the company. So and it's like it, this really cool thing. Is it moving them? Up yes, it is. Yes, it is. The promotion. So the promotion rates for Wells coming out of these programs are like way higher than average promotion rates for people who haven't been through them. So to me, I interpret that as it's sort of the, it's the lift. It's the investment. It's the, um, it's the deep dive into our, our journeys, but it's a safe space to talk about those things. And for the LGBT community, the conversations are around authenticity, bringing your full self to work, you know, how exhausting it is to cover and minimize your life in front of your customers and your branch, you know, in the Midwest or wherever they are. You know, it's a really honest conversation. Or, or um, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, if you're lesbian, not looking like maybe, I don't know, like not fitting somebody's idea of yeah. what a successful woman leader looks like. Or a gay man saying, you know, I, I get this feedback around how I speak or how I gesture. I mean, it's really ridiculous stuff, but it's real. And um, I think we're still fighting against this, this monolithic idea of what a leader looks like. And a lot of us don't fit in that. And so bias is still keeping us, keeping us you know, from achieving what we really should, but we've got to we've got to take control of that and name it, and and then kind of be really savvy about how we how we navigate around it, through it. Yeah. You know, using our allies to help us, et cetera. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> um, so, kind of off of what you were saying around the shift in what a leader looks like, my question is around you know we're shifting away from any. We're hoping to shift from bias of what a leader previously looked like, mm -hmm. but isn't this still in a way a construct of how a leader should show up and thinking about inclusivity and bringing your full self to work? If someone's not necessarily extroverted or the type who feels comfortable to be sharing these types of stories, how do you mitigate that balance of making sure we're inclusive in a leadership group, but also having the responsibility to show up in the way that you've described? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. That's a tough one. True. Yeah, um, I have to. I, I have to think about that a little bit more. I, it's true that this is a little bit of an extrovert's model, right? It's it's especially hard to expect an introvert or somebody who's a little more analytical to to even come to the table with their story. And vulnerability means something totally different to that person and feels like way more risky. I think that's very true. Um, my friend Wokey. Nabueze. I have a podcast and Wokey was on my podcast and she has the Seen and Heard project and she de describes it as being the quiet, she's the quiet girl. And Seen and Heard is all about the quiet, the quiet voices, right? So that we're not ever going to be the one that's the, on the edge of the stage, uh, maybe being that, you know, loud leader or the expressive leader, but we're going to lead in a different way and yet we still have an opportunity to lead and stretch. So what is our, what does our edge look like when that's our profile? And I guess my answer would be that how can, how can a leader who's a quieter leader or someone who leads from behind or someone that's analytical still work their edge, which is really the biggest point. And um, by the way, showing up that way is going to resonate with people that need to see that leader showing up that way. 
right? So I think I always say, you know, if we're not uncomfortable on a regular basis from wherever we're starting, we're not probably doing our work, you know? And so, but being, but the definition of what uncomfortable looks like feels different for all of us. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate that question. It doesn't look the same for everyone. Quiet advocacy, noisy advocacy, um, you know, I think, you know, leading when no one's looking. Uh, and, and, and yet you can be an incredibly inclusive leader in a quiet way by the questions you ask, the listening that you provide, um, the way that you represent inclusion um, that maybe nobody ever sees, but that they experience the impact of. And that's beautiful and important. Get, you know, I would say get others to tell your story. Um, and that's why I tell Wokey's story, because that's my way of, of signaling to people that you have a role as well. It's really important, and, and that's going to shift the reality for other people that may not be shifted by me and my style, but may be shifted by you. So that's actually a great transition to another question that's kind of percolating for me. And again, raise your hand if there's a question, we'll get you the mic. But in the meantime, I'll fill the space with my question, okay. which is um, how do you dance between f fighting to establish your credibility and your power and being being the voice, exerting your voice, and also creating the space for other people mm -hmm. to exert their voice who maybe have less power. Like, how do you navigate that? <laughs> oh, I love that question. Oh, man, it's so true. I, I um, well, we all have a different style. So, so I am actually, even though I keynote a lot, I'm actually more of a question asker versus a talker. I'm more of a, um, I love focus groups. I love interviewing people. I love, I like my podcast, not because I get the platform, but because I can give other people the platform. So, but there are some times when I am called to be the definitive voice, the one with the credibility, the one that wrote the book. You know, even though I'll, I will say, you know, the book is nowhere near and it couldn't ever be, you know, sort of a perfect solution. It's just one person's lens mm -hmm. and experience. Mm -hmm. So I think as a change agent, we need to understand what does this moment need of me? How can I be in service right now? Is it to listen? Is it to support others? Or is it to come through with the statement or the power, show the power? Um, really, and I don't even mean some, you know, we can show power just with our bodies and our voice and our presence. You know, I, I'm very conscious of using the power differently. If I'm walking into a room with employee resource groups and, and it's um, very, it's lively and open and informal, you know, how does, you, how does my power need to show up in that in a very different way? But if I'm walking into a room with executives, how you walk in, how you speak, how you use your voice, what you say really matters because you meet, I, in my experience, you meet power with power, <laughs> frankly. Mm -hmm. So you've got to learn how to, how to kind of get your grounding in that kind of room mm -hmm. um, and use your vulnerability, but you're always, always watching and how to, how to be savvy about it, right? It's a tool yeah. in your arsenal. You can't fall apart in an executive meeting. I mean... Like this is part of, I think, owning your story. Like when I gave my TED talk, I thought, how am I gonna get up on that stage and not cry? I was like, am I gonna get through my talk? You know, and I was really worried about that. But, but as you make your stories your tool, you learn, you learn how to protect yourself at the same time as you are being vulnerable um, and you're reliving something that happened to you, but you're, you're always mindful and kind of watching from a distance to see how is this going over. I'm giving you guys all of my tricks, but this is like, the, honestly, but this is kind of how I think about it because um, your stories become your tools and use, bringing them out strategically and at the right moment um, you know, leads to a sense of power and mastery that I think has been really, honestly, surprising for me. It's been really healing, actually. Yeah. It's just to tell it over and over and to be, to, for me to be reinforced by audiences that they're telling me like, you're enough. Mm. And to feel that over and over again is so, I've been adding that to me and the strength that I carry around. Yeah. So honestly, I, I feel like every time I feel I'm in community, I feel strengthened. I mean, I was just at Pride in New York and I, you know, that's just such a wonderful experience to realize how much power 
is around you and behind you in front of you and has gone before you historically. So I, I personally like to really tap into tap into um, to that and know that I'm just part of like a river, you know, and I'm in it. And all my job is just to keep kind of grabbing what I can, passing it along where I need to, um, channeling some messages that, you know, maybe I channel in a certain way and seen through my lens, it's going to sound different to someone. But I got to keep trying, you know, and that's kind of what it feels like. But there's a real flow. There's a flow to it um, once you get into it. But it's an interesting question. Yeah. So any, we have one minute left. I want to make sure that anyone who's in the room knows that you can get a free book. Um, one of Jennifer's yes, three books. If you, um, we don't have them here with us today, but if you can write your LDAP down, I will communicate with you when they arrive and we'll figure out how to get it to you. So I'm going to um, make sure to ask you to sign on this before you go. And you have one more question. One, one more question. question. Yes, absolutely. Hi. Um, okay, cool. My name is Marina and I lead a diversity initiative with my vendor team. Um, and one of our main difficulties right now is building a diverse pipeline. We don't have enough resources to hire someone who could tell us what to do or not to do. So right now I rely a lot on materials that I find online mm -hmm. and studies. And I wanted to know if you can give me any tips on for small companies or, or teams that don't have a lot of resources. How can we build a more diverse team? Mm. The vendor pipeline you're talking about? Yes. Okay. And the hiring on the vendor side, like their own hiring? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is it is difficult. You're constrained geography geographically from and what age are you hiring? Like uh, uh, out of school or or more experienced hires, all of the above? Yeah, all of the all above. The above. Yeah. yeah, because the the answer is kind of different when you're looking at you know, young hiring out of schools. You know, we always say are you looking at a broad array of schools? Are you looking at a, are you sort of throwing the job description away and thinking more broadly about the kinds of capabilities that you're looking for to the non-traditional talent? Um, and that means hiring across difference. Usually if your founder team is largely maybe say white and male or Asian and male, it's gonna mean that um, they have to be committed and to, I wouldn't say take a risk because I don't believe it's risky to you know, hire outside of your own image but they will believe that it is. And so, you know, how do we help them understand that actually hiring in your own image can harm your ability to be innovative and to generate that creative abrasion that happens from um, that diversity of talent. And I, I think you've got to start with that resistance maybe there to then kind of, you know, taking some leaps of faith and looking in under corners that you, you wouldn't have normally. And, you know, even going so far as to say, I don't want to interview if it's if the pipeline is has I mean I have a friend Adam Pizzoni who founded Yammer I don't know if any of you know who he is he sold to Microsoft his next startup he refuses to interview white um, white straight men like him <laughs> so literally they're not even getting into the pipeline he refuses he said if we let any of that happen it's going to end up that our founding team which is an education startup by the way so serving schools is is going to be again kind of largely male. And he's like, I'm not okay with that. And so I've got to take some drastic action about even who I let into the pipeline to be interviewed. Because there's so, so many male candidates that come his way and not a lot of diverse candidates. And so he's had to literally kind of say to the team, like, I, this is a non-negotiable for me. Because this founding team is so important because who you hire is then going to send a signal to your next hires and your next hires and your next hires. So literally what you do when you're small really, really matters because it will make your job so much easier in the future. So you have to be uncompromising. You might want to, you know, get some, put some metrics in place and then, um, you know, think outside the box. Watch out also for gendered language in job descriptions really interesting. There's some fascinating startups that are going on. Um, Unitive is one. Um, Text.io text is one that it literally goes through and looks at your job descriptions and flags gendered language. And that keeps basically women and non-traditional candidates away from even applying for things. So the way that we describe roles is gendered <laughs> and um, begins that process of bias that screens people self-screen out because you know if you're looking for a rock star coder you know you're using all this kind of language and women are like oh, it's not me I just don't 
could see myself in that. Especially if you're an introvert. Especially if you're an introvert. <laughs> an exactly. Introvert. And you might be a brilliant introvert. Introvert. So yeah. it really, there's so many places bias occurs, I think, that keeps your pipeline from being welcoming to, um, to even think of themselves as applying. And so I, I'm, it's, it's a long, we can talk afterwards. There's yeah. a lot more ideas. And there's a lot of ideas in here, too. Well, with that, we're going to have to end, unfortunately. Yes. But thank you very much thank for the rich guys. conversation. Thank you for thank coming. Thank you all so much for coming. So and good to see you all. Looking forward